This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. The X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All hit radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell, coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to send an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV, and our radio website, exxonradiotv.com, and the network website, xzbn.net. My guest this hour is Dr. Michael Sala. He is a pioneer in the development of exopolitics. He is the author of several books that include Kennedy's Last Stand, which was, came out in 2013, the, and let me see, Galactic Diplomacy also in 2013. Dr. Sala was an assistant professor, research, and residence in the School, uh, School of International Service, American University, from 1996 to 2004. He has a PhD in government from the University of Queensland, Australia. He is also the founder of Exopolitics Institute, a nonprofit organization that analyzes the political impl- implications of the extraterrestrial presence. Most recently, he is the author of Insiders Reveal secret space program and extraterrestrial alliances due for release in mid uh, it it was released i should say mid-september 2015 um first of all dr sala welcome back to the exxon sir great having you with us and i'm glad one of us is in the sun and you're in hawaii aloha Uh, Aloha, Rob. Yes, it's a beautiful sunny day here and uh, (laughs) right now i'm taking refuge in in the shade I'd like to tell you that my heart is broken for you, sir, but uh, that would be lying, and I i just wish I was there with you. Um, you've been in this business a long time. Um, I, I guess I, I just want to ask you one question, sir. Are we closer to ET disclosure? Are we getting closer? I think we are definitely... I think we're definitely closer to the truth emerging about what has been going on with the UFO phenomenon. And it might not be what people expected, certainly not what mm-hmm. I expected, that you know this was merely a cover of a UFO, of an extraterrestrial presence, but that it actually involves uh, secret uh, projects involving anti-gravity craft, uh, space temporal uh, drives, and uh, space battle groups wow. that have been developed in classified uh, laboratories and um, facilities. So what we consider to be science fiction may actually be, in fact, be reality. Well, you know, this is something that I'm finding more as I continue do, to do this research that a lot of the uh, top sci-fi shows that um, many of us have watched at some point, that these were... In, in some, in many cases, actually, uh, forms of soft disclosure where the truth was hidden in plain sight, so people would, at an unconscious level, um, kind of be prepared for the truth, but at a conscious level, or at least as far as uh, any official statements are concerned, you know, everything was denied. It was all something subject to conjecture. But yet, when you look at all the sci-fi shows. 
and the movies, uh, really, there's there's so much of the truth that's sure. hidden in plain sight that it's it's really incredible. So, are we seeing uh, with the advances in handheld technology more of what we can consider as subliminal programming? Uh, well, you know, the handheld technology is is just one aspect of this kind of information revolution mm -hmm. uh, that we are witnessing. Where now. Uh, you know, we've had we've had so much information that has uh, made its way into the public arena through the internet, and now uh, with the alternative news uh, phenomenon, uh, what we have is that the mainstream media is no longer the go-to place for yeah, most exactly. people to get informed, and that's that's really been a big change. And and we saw that the 2016 election actually is is probably one of the um, clearest cases of where all, people got their news from the alternative media and, and, and they you know, voted accordingly. Sure. When we come back, if you don't mind, Dr. Sala, because you have a, a PhD in government from the University of Queensland, could I just talk to you a minute or two about the 2016 election? I'm very happy to. All right, please stand by, sir. Exo Nation, our guest this hour is Dr. Michael Sala. And if you'd like to find out more about the doctor, exopolitics.org or exonews.tv. He's the author of Exposing U.S. Government Policies on Extraterrestrial Life, Exopolitics, Political Implications of the Extraterrestrial Presence, The Hero's Journey Toward a Second American Century, Galactic Diplomacy, Kennedy's Last Stand, Eisenhower, UFOs, MJ-12, and JFK's assassination, and Insider, Insiders Reveal, Secret Space Program, and Extraterrestrial Alliances. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. I am in down and dreary Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, while our guest this hour is in beautiful Hawaii. We'll both be back on the other side of this break. Whatever you do, don't go away. Hi everyone, Rob McConnell here, and I wanted to spend a moment on internet streaming. Everybody has heard about internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. TV shows. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, this product is a real winner. To learn more about 123 Ready TV, visit our website at www.xzbn.net. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Mnemology science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Mnemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. 
If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere, Florida. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine such as hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining rooms can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you visit, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic downtown Felsmere. Or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, Old Florida cuisine at its best. Explanation, uh, Dr. Michael Salas is our special guest. He also has a brand new book out entitled The U.S. Navy's Secret Space Project. And once again, if you'd like to get a hold of Dr. Salas, find out all about his exopolitics and about exo news, just go to exopolitics.org and exonews.tv. Uh, welcome back, Dr. Salas. Before we went to the break, we just touched very lightly on the 2016 election uh, some people call it a fiasco. Some people call it a wow factor. I, I'm still scratching my head trying to figure out what happened myself. Uh, you, have a, you have a PhD in government from the University of Queensland. What is your opinion of what happened in uh, the great debacle between President Donald Trump and Secretary Hillary Clinton? Well, it was... Uh a unique election in so far as many people got their views about uh, which of the candidates that they felt was the most trustworthy or, or could make the biggest uh, contribution uh, to, to their own uh, lives and, and policy preferences, uh, not from the major media, but from the alternative media. And that was really uh, something that uh, was a big surprise yeah. because uh, the, the major media, were, you know, they, they their narrative and the opinion polls that they uh, cited uh, clearly showed that Hillary Clinton was, was going to be winning this uh, quite easily easily uh, but uh, in the end it was because so many people were getting their uh, perspectives uh, from the alternative media from Breitbart News or from uh, Infowars.com uh, that kind of uh, shade of the political spectrum that uh, it, it, in the end it made a major difference because people really went out and, and voted in droves for for you know one particular candidate um, even though uh, the the major media was saying that the election was pretty much wrapped up in favor of uh, the Clinton, exactly. And and uh, how could, in your opinion, sir, based on your PhD in government, how could the media have gotten the uh, the um, polls so wrong? Well, I think it, it showed that the polls really are uh, driven by particular agendas mm -hmm. that uh, and and this was something that again and again was uh, revealed in the uh, election process itself uh, by the alternative media uh, people were pointing out how many of the polls were slanted in a way to make uh, Hillary's campaign look like it was destined to win uh, just in terms of you know clever use of uh, um, you know sampling and 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 uh, projecting certain ways in which people would vote. I mean, they used a, a, a number of techniques yeah. to kind of like skew the polls in a way that made it look like one candidate was going to win and the other lost. But in the end of the day, you know, people 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 went with what the alternative news was telling them, and that was that you know Trump was this kind of groundswell of opinion, or or he was leading this movement against the. Uh, the political mainstream, you know, both Republican and Democrat, and a lot of enough people went for that narrative yeah. that he got elected. I thank you very much for your insight, sir. Now let's talk about um, your mainstay, 
ExoPolitics, and Exo News. Who is William Tompkins, and what are Tompkins' claims when it comes to regarding the Navy's espionage program monitoring advanced Nazi airspace, I'm sorry, aerospace programs during World War II? And why is it important? Well, it's actually a, a really fundamental um, a development here in terms of how we understand the whole UFO phenomenon because, you know, previously uh, most people associate the UFO phenomenon with the Roswell crash. Yeah. And even though there have been kind of earlier uh, incidents, uh, you know, that seems to be the kind of like the modern day jumping off point to understand mm-hmm. the whole phenomenon. But what William Tompkins does is he kind of redefines or introduces us to this Navy program that existed from the very beginning of the U.S. involvement in the Second World War, which was focused quite clearly on what Nazi Germany was doing in terms of developing um, aerospace technologies uh, that were, had some kind of anti-gravity or space-time uh, component to it, and that the Navy's uh, spies that were embedded uh, throughout uh, occupied Europe were bringing about incredible um, intelligence data about how successful the Nazis were in uh, developing up to 30 different prototype flying saucer craft Mm -hmm. and that uh, this was something that Tompkins was then, his job was to take this information to um, classified facilities, think tanks, university departments, wherever anyone could make sense of it. That was, uh, that was Tompkins job to kind of like brief people about, you know, what these Navy spies uh, were bringing back. In your opinion, Dr. Sala, what happened in 1947 at Roswell, New Mexico, when there was an alleged UFO crash. Well, uh, you know, that's uh, something that I I feel has been um, kind of very clearly answered in terms of some of the uh, main uh, researchers in the field, uh, in particular uh, Don Schmidt Mm -hmm. and and, and Thomas Carey. uh, Their their book, uh, Witness to Roswell, I think did a superb job in just kind of outlining the extensive number of whistleblowers that uh, were able to give us a good idea into what happened at Roswell, that it, that it did involve um, these extraterrestrial craft and that uh, it, it was something that uh, involved multiple levels of a, of a cover-up that, uh, that was led by the U.S. Air Force. But the fact that both Ta- Carrie and Schmidt were involved in the, um, the alien mummy in Mexico, doesn't that kind of put a little bit of a gray cloud over the research that they claim to have done in the Roswell case? I think what what it does is it just kind of highlights the difficulty that all researchers have in the field Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, we have to deal with uh, disinformation. We have to deal with the possibility that that people are going to try to kind of pull a fast one over us. And and if we let our guard down, and I think in that case – uh, you know, they probably let their guard down and, uh, you know, they, they kind of made some assumptions there that in the end kind of uh, was very embarrassing. But, you know, it, when you look at their book, um, it, it really does. I mean, it, like, for example, the affidavit they provided uh, from uh, William Halt, uh, the, the public information officer from the Roswell Army Airfield. I mean, this this was quite clearly... Uh, evidence that uh, the, that the cover up of the U- of the UFO crash at Roswell was something that was being orchestrated uh, by senior Air Force officials. I my only problem, well, one of the problems that I look point to when I talk about the Roswell case is what happened when Jesse Marcel left the base, went to Brazil's farm, picked up some of the crash debris, and instead of maintaining the chain of custody and evidence by bringing it directly back to the base, he goes to his house and lets his, wakes up his wife and his child and lets them play with the evidence. Now, being an ex-cop myself, I know as soon as that happens, that evidence is tainted and can't be used. Mm. Well, you know, this is what uh, you know, Jesse Marcel... Uh, Senior and Jesse Marcel Jr. both say actually happened. So, you know, they are primary witnesses and, and, you know, this is what they say occurred. And, um, you know, we've got to go with what the primary witnesses say to 
try and kind of a- analyze exactly what what occurred. And yeah, you're quite yeah. right that you know he was probably breaking you know chain of custody when it came to this evidence. But sure. um, you know he he probably acted uh, because he thought that this wasn't something that would in any way prejudice his investigation of I, what was I, going on there. I understand that, sir. But what does that tell you about him as as a member of the armed forces when he when he did not follow protocol, he did not follow orders. He went his own way. Doesn't that seem strange? Um, well, I guess it tells us a little bit about his personality. Mm-hmm. That uh, you know, this was something that was uh, so shocking to him that uh, that he he didn't he wanted to share it with his family. That this was uh, in- incredible. That this was not just an ordinary crash involving some classified mm-hmm. aircraft. That this was, um, in his view, clearly. A case of some kind of extraterrestrial phenomenon, and um, he, he felt that this was something. Uh, his his family he wanted to just kind of share that, and I, I guess it's a very human response. But yeah, you know, I, I agree with what you're saying yeah. that it's certainly outside of what a professional officer, you know, would have been expected to do. Yeah, I I, I don't think my wife would have appreciated me bringing a criminal home that I had just arrested, or in the middle of transporting from one station to another and say, look, honey, look what I brought home, a criminal. But it wasn't a UFO or an anticipated UFO. Do you think that the UFO sighting uh, that Kennel, uh, that uh, Arnold Kenneth had just prior to the crash may have had something to do with the heightened suspicion that this was a UFO? Uh, well, you know, this was uh, the, the Kenneth Arnold case, uh, you know, that I think was probably a, a case that may have involved some kind of classified technology uh, program mm-hmm. that was occurring at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, so it, it, it isn't a necessarily a case of, say, an extraterrestrial visitation because, you know, those kind of uh, flying wing aircraft were, were things that were being developed, um, you know, in Nazi Germany and also uh, uh, immediately after by some of the, the major companies. I, I think it was the, the B-49 that was uh, being developed by Jack uh, Northrop, uh, the flying wing. Uh, so, you know, th- these kinds of technologies were being developed um, and it, it may not have been an extraterrestrial craft that Kenneth Arnold cite, uh, cited, mm-hmm. And so in that sense, you know, we have the two things running parallel. You, you have on the one hand what may well be extraterrestrial visitation as, as occurred in Roswell. Right. And on the other hand, you have the development of these classified um, aerospace programs that were occurring, uh, that were being uh, built by the Navy and by the Air Force. But what I was getting at, sir, is that do you think that with all the media hype about UFOs that was caused by the Kenneth Arnold sighting that when... Um, Jesse Marcel saw the debris field that he could that that his anticipation of a UFO crash might have had something to do with the fact of him driving back to his house and showing his son what it was. I uh, I don't know if you know the the kind of Kenneth Arnold incident was uh, something that may have uh, contributed to mm-hmm. uh, Major Marcel taking that action i mean he he was a a major in uh, air force intelligence Mm -hmm. and so uh you know responsible position to have and i think he probably would have been familiar with a lot of uh, uh, advanced or or classified aerospace programs because as you well know i'm sure you know the 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 501 uh, the 501 squadron was at the time that the most um, you know, that was the elite uh, Air Force uh, bomber squadron because yep. it, it was the only one that had uh, nuclear weapons at the time. So it was one of the best right. um, in, in, at his job. And so he he probably really, I think, uh, was you know, really overwhelmed by the significance of seeing what he, I think, concluded was likely um, an extraterrestrial crash. All right, you and I have to take a break uh, for our news at the bottom of the cover, Dr. Sal. When we come back, I'd like to talk more about um, William Tompkins and some of the other uh, information that, uh, that you were able to find out through, um, through the FOIA documents that you submitted. Exonation. Nation, our guest this hour is Dr. Michael Sala, and uh, he's got a brand new book out, The U.S. Navy's Secret Space Project. Uh, where is the book available, Dr. Sala? Uh, uh, the book uh, is available through the website exopolitics.org or at uh, amazon.com. There you go, Exxon Nation.
great book by a, by a very interesting gentleman. And we'll both be back on the other side of this news break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Now, don't forget, Exxon Nation, if you would like to uh, have a all in one multimedia app on your laptop, on your desktop, on your iPad, on your iPhone, all you have to do is go to xzbn.net and click on 123 Ready TV. Check it out. I'm Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Hi, everyone. Rob McConnell here, and I wanted to spend a moment on Internet streaming. Everybody has heard about Internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the Internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. TV shows. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, sense this product is a real winner to learn more about 123 ready tv visit our website at www.xzbn.net this is the exxon broadcast network broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers including cnn broadcast network sirius satellite network star media good news radio network Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. There's a legend shared by many indigenous cultures of a time when the nations were cast to the four corners of the world. Each nation was given a body of sacred knowledge that held a different portion of the truth to preserve. True reality could not be known until all the nations reunited, combining the information. If a single one was missing, the world could not be reborn and darkness would prevail. The Science of Magic Radio is dedicated to reuniting the sacred knowledge. With the understanding, none of us has all the answers, but together we can open new perceptions and possibilities. Through our combined vision, the world can be reborn into a place where darkness no longer prevails. 
Join me, Gwilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, or visit us at thescienceofmagic.net. Am I bad, Exxon Nation? It's Monday. I have to apologize to our guest, and I have to apologize to you, the Exxon Nation. Dr. Sala's new book is entitled, The U.S. Navy's Secret Space Program. Am I right, Doctor? That's correct, yes. <laughs> I apologize for calling it a project. So once again, explanation, it's the U.S. Navy Secret Space Program by Dr. Michael Sala. It's available at exopolitics.org and on amazon.com. Okay, you know, apparently you had had filed FOIA documents uh, to um, to get some of Tompkins' claims. Can you explain the process by which the documents were obtained, Doctor? Uh, sure. Well, uh, Bill Tompkins' claims uh, were centered around him being involved in this espionage program that was being led by a rear admiral who was in charge of uh, a, a department at the Naval Air Station in San Diego. And uh, it took us a while to track down uh, whether or not this admiral actually existed. Uh, but once able to verify that uh, such an admiral did did exist and did run uh, the assembly and repair department at the Naval Air Sta Station, which is where Tompkins says the espionage program was held. Then uh, FOIA requests were filed, mm -hmm. and um, it, eventually I got uh, 1,500 pages of documents uh, that basically substantiated some of Tompkins' key claims in terms of this admiral leading this espionage program out of uh, the Naval Air Station. Um, and, and some of the documents really uh, are, are quite critical in terms of like um, being hard evidence that uh, Tompkins was involved in some covert program uh, with this admiral. Now, was this admiral um, Rico Bota? Um, that's correct, yes. And and he was uh, in, in charge of the assembly and re, uh, re repair mm -hmm. department at the Naval Air Station um, from the latter part of 1942 right up until the beginning of 1946. And uh, his position there was that he was the officer in charge of uh, overhauling and repairing and, and modernizing the, the Navy's uh, top fighters and bombers that were being used in the war. Uh, that was his day job and at night according to Bill Tompkins uh, Boda led this covert espionage program where there were 29 Navy spies embedded in occupied Europe who were reporting back on what the Nazis were doing in terms of their aerospace programs and that Boda then set up the process by which Tompkins would then put together briefing packets distilled from the debriefings of these Navy spies, and the briefing packets would then be uh, flown to various think tanks and aircraft uh, facilities and university departments, anywhere where there were scientists or engineers could, that could make sense of what the Nazis were doing, because the Navy were trying to work out whether or not these kinds of technologies that the Nazis were developing and that they, would, that they had put together various prototypes of these kinds of advanced aerospace craft, whether any of those uh, could affect the outcome of the war. So it was a very serious project, quite clearly. Imagine. And um, you know, Tompkins said that this was uh, something that uh, he was involved in throughout the Second World War. I was wondering if you could tell us about the FOIA document that established a connection between Boda and the Los Angeles air raid incident. Right. Well, that's a that's a key document because uh, the Los Angeles air raid incident occurred um, during the night of February 24th and 25th of 1942, and you know, there are uh, there were a number of reports at the time that uh, as many as two craft were retrieved from that incident. Um, you know, there are. Uh, leaked documents, majestic documents that refer to uh, two craft being retrieved and that uh, that one of these craft was then taken to uh, the Army Air Force's premier research facility, which was 
um, at the time and continues to be uh, the, the top foreign technology research division for the Air Force, uh, which is uh, um, a Wright Field, or now as it's called Wright-Patterson um, Air Force Base, and that one of the documents that emerged uh, through the F uh, FOIA Act was a document showing that on the very day um, that this craft was allegedly uh, recovered after the incident at in Los Angeles and sent uh, and, and orders were given for it to be sent to Wrightfield, that on that very same day, uh, Bolter, who was at that time in charge of the power plant division for the uh, Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics in Washington, D.C. He receives orders to fly to Wright Field and to be there in early March. Presumably this is when uh, whatever it was that was discovered uh, from the L.A. raid would be taken to Wright Field. So, so this was an mm. uh, important document, I think, linking Boulder to that incident. What do you think happened to the craft and uh, the two craft and their occupants? Well, as as far as uh, Bill Tompkins uh, is aware, mm -hmm. I mean, he says that uh, you know through his involvement in this uh, Navy espionage program, he learned that that two craft were recovered, but they were both uh, pilotless drone flying saucers, and that uh, and this was something that uh, was being studied mm -hmm. uh, by the, the by the top scientists, and um, and because these were foreign technologies, they were taken uh, to the top foreign technology research uh, facility in the country, which at that time was at Wright Field. So let me ask you this. Why do you then believe the uh, Los Angeles events involved the recovery of two alien, oh, I'm sorry, alien flying craft, but there were no bodies? They were drones? That's right, yes. Okay, gotcha. uh, this is something that yeah, this is something that uh, Bill Tompkins says that he mm -hmm. was exposed to that information while serving on this uh, and this uh, covert Navy intelligence program. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do know, of course, from historic documents that the incident did occur, that there were a number of craft yeah. up there, that there were you know, uh, several thousand artillery shells that were kind of launched against them, um, and, and that there were reports of you know one or more of the craft being shot down, uh, but that the major newspapers basically dismissed those reports as being unsubstantiated. Uh, but later on um, in the... Uh, uh, in the 1990s, uh, when you had the leaks of the Majestic documents, um, several of these documents actually referred to two craft being retrieved uh, from the Los Angeles incident. Now, of, of course, you know the Majestic documents themselves are, are, are something that uh, are very controversial. Yes. But still, you know, we, we have multiple sources actually uh, referring to something being retrieved and so when you add all these up together and 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 then you have uh, admiral border being uh given those orders to travel to Wrightfield on the day of the los angeles air raid incident you know you put all those things together you know the conclusion is that something was discovered something was retrieved and taken uh to be studied uh at the at the place uh which at the time and, and today continues to be the premier research facility mm -hmm. uh for the army air force of uh, foreign technologies if these craft were of extraterrestrial uh, origin and they were drones, why would the ETs use craft that were driven by ETs in the Roswell case? Wouldn't they also want to use drones to keep their anonymity? Um, well, I, I think that uh, you know the Roswell case um, may well have involved a different group of uh, extraterrestrials mm -hmm. uh, that well, whatever happened at the Los, Ange Los Angeles air raid incident um, that this was something that I I believe and this is what I argue in the new book um, that this was actually kind of like a gift like a, a way in which uh, this group of extraterrestrials could help uh, the the US uh, better understand exactly what was happening in Nazi Germany, uh, that Nazi Germany was doing its own advanced uh, kind of um, flying saucer uh, projects. And that, uh, and this is something uh, Bill Tompkins says 
the Navy discovered that mm-hmm. the Nazis were actually being actively helped by a group of extraterrestrials. And, and that's you know quite phenomenal uh, for a lot of people to think that, you know, is it possible that Nazi Germany was being helped during the war by one group of extraterrestrials and that secretly another group of extraterrestrials were, were, were helping the Allied powers? But that's exactly what uh, Tompkins says uh, was occurring. And uh, this is, he says, what the... Navy spies were telling uh, the Admiral Bolta and the other Navy officers that were a part of this uh, Navy espionage program. You know, every alien contact you that I've ever had on the show or pre- people who are, I'm putting this in air quotations, experts into the UFO phenomenon, tell me that the ETs have a pact that they will not interfere with the development of any country on earth so why would one et group help the russians while another et group i'm sorry help the germans and another et group help the americans if there's this non-interference clause well i I think that that non-interference clause uh probably does exist Mm -hmm. and that um, those that uh, are kind of more ethical in terms of how they interact with uh, developing worlds like ours, right? You know, and we have to kind of think of think of our, our planet as a developing world. If mm-hmm. there are extraterrestrials visiting from other star systems, um, that they do have highly developed codes, um, but that you know that doesn't mean that all extraterrestrial groups are, are going to follow the law, just as in, as we know, um, in international politics, I mean, you have m- many nations that, uh, um, uh, that while they follow kind of uh, norms of international law, there are always going to be some na- nations that are going to invade neighbours or intrude in the affairs of others, despite what international law tells uh, tells them. And, you know, probably the United States is probably one of the, the biggest violators of <laughs> national sovereignty around the world. <laughs> Sir, I agree with you 100%. Um, why don't the ETs just land and get it over with? You know, like, you know, the White House, Red Square, the Kremlin, Ottawa, Parliament Hill, Buckingham Palace. Why don't they just land, get it over with, so that they can help this world be a better place using their technology and their advanced sciences? I, I think that you know, the extraterrestrials, um, no matter what perspective mm-hmm. or you know what kind of uh, ethical behavior they conduct themselves with, uh, I think ultimately they, they're going to kind of like say, well, um, you know, what I mean, who do we form agreements with? And um, the agreements are not going to be with the private citizens; they're going to be with elected elected representatives or with um, the uh, the military intelligence communities uh, of the major nations around the world and if and if the intelligence the national security system uh, decrees that this is information that's not going to be shared with the general public or the mass media or even elected officials mm-hmm. then I, I think the extraterrestrials hands are, are pretty much tied you know if they have agreements and I think that they, there's a good case to be made that agreements have been reached um, you know with different major nations uh, you know, ever since the second world war and that uh, these agreements uh, you know part of the uh, part of the agreement on on the side of the the major nations that were a party to these agreements mm-hmm. was that the extraterrestrials would remain silent I've got about uh, 40 seconds before I take my uh, break sir but wouldn't MJ12 prove this the existence of that agreement well, uh, in MJ-12, I, I believe, uh, as the documents suggest, was something that was convened uh, by President Truman and then uh, uh, gradually increased its power during right. the Eisenhower ad- administration. And that the people that were making these policy decisions uh, were increasingly from the MJ-12 committee and that power... All right, Doctor, uh, I, I hate to do this to you, my there, friend, but we've yeah. got to take our break. Please stand by. Exxon Nation, Dr. Michael Sal is with us. When we come back, I'll tell you how to get all the information you need from the fine doctor. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, 
Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. President of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? I'm Dr. Kimberly McGeorge, and on The Secret to Everything, we will merge the practical with open investigation into all realms of the mysterious. We will talk to cutting-edge alternative health practitioners, those who inspire and motivate you in business and life, and of course, we will share stories of the paranormal, conspiracy, and cryptozoology. You will transform because of the frequency I carry, the frequencies my guests carry. Life may never be the same after you listen to this program. For the secret to everything is for you, the listener. For those who desire more in every area of their lives and believe that it can still be found. Listen and discover thesecrettoeverything.com. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. Exonation Dr. Michael Salas, is our special guest. His new book that just came out is entitled U.S. Navy Secret Space Program and Nordic Extraterrestrial Alliance. And it's, you can find out all about this book on his website, exopolitics.org, and of course on Amazon.com. Dr. Asala, who is Leslie Stevens, and what kind of agreement did he have with Gene Roddenberry in creating the concept of Star Trek? 
Well, Leslie Stevens was the producer of the Outer Limits uh, science uh, fiction series, and uh, Jaden Roddenberry actually attended some of the uh, sessions of the Outer Limits and, and got a lot of his ideas for his next uh, show from uh, Leslie Stevens. Ah. Now, what makes Leslie Stevens um, quite unique is that he was the son of Admiral Leslie Stevens, who was one of the direct uh, Navy officials involved in this uh, space program that the that the Navy had set up um, as a consequence of the espionage program that had been conducted during the Second World War. So uh, Leslie Stevens, uh, the Admiral, uh, was uh, a key figure in the development of psychological operations uh, during the 1950s. Uh, he actually uh, helped the Navy set that up. And his son, Leslie Stevens, uh, actually uh, worked for U.S. military intelligence. That he was uh, he was involved um, also in in that side of um, oper- military operations. Mm. And so uh, both Stevens, father and son, uh, were aware of what was going on as far as the Navy uh, developing this program. And I, I believe that part of the psychological warfare program was to. Uh, use the media, the mass media, as a means of seeding the truth, you know, hiding the truth in, in plain sight, and that Leslie Stevens Jr. worked with his father um, in this, and that uh, and so that by the time he met Gene Roddenberry um, um, in 1963-64, uh, he was feeding Roddenberry a lot of the ideas uh, that ultimately led to the creation of Star Trek. And I, I believe, um, and this is what I argue in detail, mm-hmm. uh, there's a chapter in the book uh, that uh, focuses on this, that basically the whole Star Trek series, when you look at it, it's quite clearly uh, a kind of reflection of many of the the, the same kind of extraterrestrial uh, groups that the Navy had become aware of during the 1940s and 50s. Including the Nordics? Including the Nordics, yes. That uh, the Nordics, uh, you know, these were represented by by the Vulcans, and even you could, uh, you could even say that uh, that uh, Captain Kirk himself uh, represented, uh, you know, how the Nordics operated. Uh, that the, the entire concept of the Galactic Federation mm-hmm. uh, was something that was based on this Nordic extraterrestrial alliance that had helped. Uh, the Allied powers during the war, uh, during the Second World War, uh, defeat Nazi Germany, which was being helped by another group of extraterrestrials, which in the Star Trek series are depicted as the Klingons. So, you, so you, you have the the Klingons and the Federation in the original kind of iteration of Star of the Star Trek series as being principally involved in this galactic wide. Uh, war having their own separate zones of influence, and I think this is um, something that uh, basically was based on what the Navy spies uh, had revealed to the Navy during those debriefings uh, during the Second World War. With all the computer hacking that is going on these days, Doctor, would it be possible to still maintain in secure files somewhere? the information pertaining to any ET contact with any major government. And wouldn't it be a coup for, let's say, Russia or China if they were able to hack into the U.S. and prove to the American public that they had been lied to for so many years? Wouldn't that put a big dent in the credibility of the government and possibly the fall of the government? Um, yes, that that would definitely be uh, something that uh, would would be quite a coup um, if any major government got access to mm-hmm. these files uh, that deal with these highly classified programs um, and the involvement with extraterrestrial life. I mean, these um, files are part of compartmentalized uh, programs, um, which is way above top secret. And and, and typically, uh, you, know, you, you look at, say, the Edward Snowden uh, documents, mm-hmm. uh, those leaks of the NSA. Um, you know, these were documents that uh, kind of dealt with uh, secret uh, and uh, maybe top secret, but uh, they didn't go beyond that. They didn't go into special access programs or compartmented programs. Uh, similarly, with the WikiLeaks, um, you know, the, with the WikiLeaks, the, the State Department files, these were 
confidential and state department uh, sorry confidential and secret files uh, so certainly yes um, you know, the hackers can get into um, some of the uh, kind of files that are stored uh, that deal with kind of secrets that are uh, classified at those lower levels of uh, you know, confidential, secret, or top secret, according to the U.S. classifications uh, system. But when it comes to compartmentalized programs, uh, the, the files, uh, the, the kind of pr uh, security protocols that are in place, are much more stringent. Um, it's much easier to control because you know each of these compartments. You know, we're not talking about a vast bureaucracy of you know hundreds of thousands of people. These these compartmentalized programs are much tighter in terms of the personnel who have access. So that way, they're able to. Control control um, who, who uh, has access to these files and whether or not any digital um, files uh, are made available to anyone. During the research for your book, U.S. Navy Secret Space Program and Nordic Extraterrestrial Alliance, uh, as well as any of the research that you did on Nazi Germany and their space program, did you come across any conclusion or any possible explanation for Foo Fighters? Well, uh, these, I, I think, were probably uh, one of the technologies that the Nazis were looking at uh, that they were hoping to weaponize for the war effort, um, that uh, the Nazis were uh, using a, a lot of the kind of information that they had gained from many different sources and trying to find out which one uh, would be of greatest utility for the war effort. And uh, this is probably an explanation for the Foo Fighters that seem to be some kind of uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, device that uh, would interfere with the electronics of the of any aircraft that it encountered. And so maybe this was something that the Nazis hoped would be uh, effective against the, the, the bomber fleets that the Allies were using during the Second World War. But uh, I think that in the end, um, you know, the, the Nazis in Europe at least were just overwhelmed by, by the number of uh, bomber aircraft that the Allies were sending. I had a guest on the show two weeks ago, sir, and he said something that I've been scratching my head about, and maybe you can help. He said, if it wasn't for the Germans, the United States would never have gotten to the moon. How do you feel about that statement? Uh, well, that, that's, that's very interesting. Um, I, I wouldn't agree with that. I, I think that... Um, there have been classified programs that have been successful in getting to the moon and uh, other other places like Mars. I, I think that this is one of the things that um, a number of the secret, uh, space program whistleblowers that I've been working with have been talking about bases on the moon, bases on Mars, and and kind of deep space. Um, so you know, without Germany's, you know, without the German technology uh, projects that uh, were underway during the Second World War, it's, it's possible that these kinds of classified programs wouldn't have been successful because they do use anti-gravity and kind of torsion uh, field uh, technologies for their propulsion systems. But as far as rocket propulsion is concerned, I, I, I think that, uh, um, you know, yes, uh, you know, the that those principles were well understood and that uh, you know, they, they would have gotten to the moon eventually because, uh, you know, despite, uh, I mean, obviously the, the Germans were the first to develop rocket-propelled uh, technologies, sure. you know, the V1, V2 yeah. rockets and so forth. But but the U.S. were also doing the, the same thing. I mean, the, you know, the U.S. wasn't that far behind when it came to rocket technologies. Just the, the Nazis were a little bit ahead, mm -hmm. but eventually the U.S. would have caught up. So, you know, maybe the moon landing wouldn't have happened in 69. You know, the NASA moon, moon landing maybe would have been a decade later, but I think it would have eventually happened. I've got less than two minutes, and I this is my final question for you, sir. And once again, I thank you for coming on. I look forward to the next time you're on with us so I can talk to you about uh, what's really happening in Antarctica. But why do you believe President Trump issued a top-secret memorandum to lift the secrecy order on over over a 1,000 patent applications dealing with health, anti-aging, and free energy? Uh, well, this is uh, this is something that uh, I, I, I got a, a briefing from one of the that I've been working with. Uh, his name is Corey Good, and he basically says that uh, he was told that uh, President Trump had issued this memorandum, this top-secret memorandum that had been 
uh, given uh, to, uh, sent to the Pentagon and to the intelligence community to declassify over 1,000 uh, uh, patent applications that were held up uh, on national security wow. orders out of a pool of over 5,000. And so when I kind of uh, did my due diligence mm -hmm. on that claim, I found out that, yes, those, those figures were accurate, that in fact uh, there are 5,700 uh, patent applications that have been stopped um, through secrecy orders, and so uh, declassifying a thousand of those is very possible. But that what intrigued me was a statement that uh, Trump made in his uh, in his uh, inauguration speech, where he referred he, and he, he said, "quote We stand at the birth of a new millennium, ready to unlock the mysteries of space, to free the Earth from the miseries of disease, and to harness the energies, industries, and technologies of tomorrow." End quote. And so that particular sentence in his inauguration speech to me was uh, corroboration that such a secret memorandum yeah. was being planned by Trump during his inauguration and that uh, shortly afterwards he did issue it. Dr. Michael Sala, thank you so much, sir, for joining us tonight. Continued success and uh, exonation. If you'd like to get a copy of the U.S. Navy Secret Space Program, visit Dr. Sala's sites exopolitics.org, exonews.tv, and his book is available on Amazon.com. We'll be back after the news at six and a half minutes past. Don't go away.